But first I wanted to start with something that I think most Americans don't understand, which is the right in Europe versus the right wing in the United States. If you were to ask most Americans, what do conservatives stand for? Right? What, what, what is the right wing all about? Just generically, presumably all over the world. What do conservatives stand for? They might say authoritarianism. That's typical of conservative regimes. The Chinese Communist regime is is very conservative, uh, rather repressive. I mean, you know, Singapore super conservative, uh, the Gulf states super Saudi Arabia super conservative. These are not bastions of liberality. They don't, you know, they don't love free speech that kind of thing. So anyhow, they may say that, but I think that that the the big the big thing that people would assume from, you know, if you were to ask Americans what do conservatives stand for, is they would say they stand for small government. This is the result of a arguably 45 year war. I mean, a well funded, we're talking probably multiple billions, in fact, I would say probably multiple tens of billions of dollars have been put into this effort since 1972, when it really got kicked off as a result of uh, Lewis Powell's memo to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And led to Lewis Powell being put on the Supreme Court uh, by Richard Nixon, and Lewis Powell then authoring the decision in 1976 in the Buckley case saying that in fact, if a billionaire or a company, well, actually, he, in 76, he was, if a billionaire wants to spend money to buy a politician, that's his free speech right. That somehow money is in the First Amendment. Spending money to influence politics, it's not called bribery, it's called free speech, and it's in the First Amendment. This was Lewis Powell's big contribution to the thing. And then by 2010, you know, they had m not only put that on steroids, and in fact, actually in 77, a year after the Buckley case and the First National Bank versus Bilotti case, uh, Lewis Powell again, with uh, over Rehnquist's dissent, by the way, Lewis Powell said this applies not only to billionaires, but also to corporations. And then in Citizens United, they struck down the 1907 Tillman Act, and they struck down large chunks of several uh, reform acts from 1973 all the way up to I think 99 or 2000, McCain, fine gold, whenever that was, struck down much of all of them. And so today in the United States, conservative typically means not, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, the authoritarians, you know, they're the ones who always want more wars. You go over to Fox News, it's all about, oh my God, I'd be afraid, be afraid. But mostly what it means is making government weak enough that corporations and billionaires can write the rules of the game. That's what, that's what conservative means in the United States. It means, as Grover Norquist famously told Mar Eliasson on NPR back eight or ten years ago, it means shrinking government down to the size uh, where you can drown it in a bathtub. Now, why would you want to sh drown government in a bathtub? Because then the corporations and the billionaires can play uninhibited. They don't have to worry about the rabble. They don't have to worry about the average person. So most people in America assume that that's the case in Europe as well. And, you know, in the United Kingdom, there is some truth to that. It's not anywhere like it is in the United States. But in the UK, they're, you know, they, particularly the banksters, have considerable influence over the political parties. And I would argue that much of that might be because Rupert Murdoch controls so much of the media in the United, in the United Kingdom. He's got the equivalent of Fox News over there, Sky News. I believe Sky's is. Maybe it's, maybe it's another network, whatever it is. He, and, he's, and, and he owns the Times of London, and he owns a bunch of the other newspapers. And, you know, that influence is not to be ignored. But let's just quickly go through some of the right-wing groups in Europe. And I think you're going to discover something astonishing. 
All of these groups, by the way, are rising rapidly in Europe in terms of popularity. They're rising from like 3% to 5, 6, 8, 10%, but they're rising. So we start out with the National Front. The National Front is uh, Marie Le Pen. She is the, her father was the guy who started it. She is now the, the visible face of it. They pulled 16% in the last uh, presidential election in France. This from a, um, a great summary. It was published originally over at, uh, I'm not sure where, iTunes. That doesn't work. Okay. In any case, oh, it's Huffington Post. Yeah, this is, this is uh, a Huffington Post piece by uh, Nick Robbins Early. Huffington Post has the worst print function on earth, so it's, it's very difficult. You find a, it's, I very rarely look for news on Huffington Post because I can't print their stuff out. Anyway, but this is this is one of them. Uh, they pulled ten to sixteen percent of the vote in the French presidential election. Uh, but here, here's the thing: accusations of anti-Semitism and racism have always plagued the party. Ba- basically, uh, the the right-wing National Front party in France is all about: we don't want no more brown people in this country. We don't want no more Muslims in this country. France for white French people. I mean, that's that's basically what they're all about. Then you got a Greece. Mikos Mikhailakos Lykos's uh, Golden Dawn Party. The Golden Dawn Party actually uses a variation on the swastika as their logo. Uh, this party, uh, widely described as a new, new as a neo-Nazi party, Golden Dawn has been linked to hundreds of violence attacks against minorities. Once again, Golden Dawn doesn't care about corporations. Neither does Marie Le Pen, or the size of government. They just don't want immigrants. Then we got a Flemish interest. They're in favor of the secession of uh, Flanders from Belgium to multiculturalism, and they want strict limits on immigration. Then you go to the Danish People's Party, right-wing party in in Denmark. They got 13 seats out of the 179 in the last uh, parliament. Their positions, nationalist sentiment, anti-immigration rhetoric. They view themselves as strongly nativist, and they want to restrict benefits to immigrants. In the Netherlands... Uh, Geert Wilder's uh, Party for Freedom, fierce and vocal anti-Islam stance. And in Sweden, the Sweden Democrats, founded in 1988, this is their, it was originally a white supremacist group. And now they're pretty much still a white supremacist group. They've got about 5% of the vote. Why is it, you may ask, that none of the hard-right governments in Europe are talking about shrinking the size of government? None of the hard-right parties, rather than Europe, are talking about shrinking the size of government. Because that's not their shtick. Because in Europe, billionaires and big corporations find it much harder to buy government. I'll tell you why in a minute. This is the Tom Hartman Program. This is just sort of the beginning of this analysis. But this, this is a really critical thing, and it comes back to our Supreme Court and why the United States is exceptional, shall we say?